Hello everyone. In this video and the next two videos, we are going to talk about force control in robots and hybrid force motion control and then impedance control. But all are under the category of force control in robots. So far, what we have seen, whether it was um, independent or decentralized or it was multivariate centralized, they were all motion control only but now we have to consider the control of forces that are applied by the robot end effector on the environment on the objects that the end effector is uh, basically holding uh, handling for many tasks this force control is very very important like for example when you're handling fragile objects right or uh, you are basically performing something like, let's say, uh, if you have an arm that is doing some um, assembly in the um, factory, if it is trying to, let's say, do some welding, some cleaning, grinding, deburring, anything like that, wash a window, write something. You simply cannot apply a lot of force by the end effector. You know, these robots are typically very rigid. And uh, you have to uh, track and control the amount of force applied by the end effectors. Because if you don't, there is a very good chance that you break something, right? And... Um, these robots really, if you don't control their forces, if you don't have a way to control it, they might easily damage the environment, the people themselves, and so on. So you can end up with disasters. Now, uh, in this video, we are going to talk about pure force control, which is mostly an imaginary situation, really, in real life. Uh, you don't always entirely control the force of the robot not also you mostly entirely control the motion of the robot in real life what you have to control about a robot is a combination of force and motion so in the next video we are going to talk about the important topic of hybrid force and motion control which is uh, a lot more realistic than pure force or pure motion control but in order to do that, first we need to look at the pure force control here. We already have seen pure motion control in the past. And then, as I said, in the next video, we combine. And then uh, in this hybrid force motion control, we consider the environment that the robot is interacting with entirely rigid, infinitely rigid, which is not the case. Any object has some stiffness. Any object will deform when the robot applies some amount of force in them. And that's where the more sophisticated algorithm of control comes in called the impedance control. Or the other version, compliance control. So, um, if we want to control the forces, because for motion we learned that we can... Uh, get the feedback from the position using motor encoders and for um, angular velocities or uh, basically generalized velocities mostly using tachometers. What about the forces or moments? Do we have any sensor in a robot that can give us a measured value of force or a um, moment at the end effector? And the answer is yes. In general, there are three types of sensors. The first category is called the wrist force sensor. Something like um, what you can see here, FT, or force sensor. Okay, and uh, this uh, force sensor or force torque sensor, really, FT sensor. They can have several uh, different versions, depending on how many axes they can measure. The most complete one is a six axis force torque sensor. Like this is the most complete type of sensor you can get. It measures the forces and the torques aligned or about X, Y, and Z axis. They are not cheap typically. They are typically in an order of uh, 2000 to $4,000, $5,000. Just the regular ones, not the very sophisticated ones. 
Okay, so they are not cheap technologies, but um, for many applications, when the robot itself is a couple of hundred thousand dollars or million dollars or so, that is a must. So that is FT sensor, which typically uh, is attached to the uh, end effector or the robot tool and to the end of the last link through the flanges, right? What you can see here. And most of these uh, force sensor, torque sensors, or the combinations, the technology for measuring for them is typically using strain gauges. Strain gauge is one of the things that you hopefully have seen in your solid mechanics course, right? It is a uh, basically circuit um, with uh, resistance values and the resistance of one of these you are going to change by um, elongating that element so you have a few uh, resistance in a, a circuit in a bridge typically configuration and one of them you change the resistance of it by um, uh, the application of the force, right? Because if that resistance is considered just a piece of a regular metal and you stretch it, the length of the resistor would change. And you know that the resistance of a resistor does depend on the length, correct? As you remember uh, from hopefully physics, the resistance of a resistor R is the specific resistance times the length of the um, resistor divided by the cross section so the longer it gets the bigger resistance it shows and that change in the resistance is um, converted into a change in the voltage okay and you can measure that change in the voltage and um, maybe you can make that change in the voltage proportional to change in the length and then from that with voltage rate you can say how much what i have had change in the length now if you have a simple um, wire like this with cross section a with young modulus e with length l correct and uh, the forces applied on it are f and f as you know from solid mechanics, the change in the length, if it's pure intention, is going to be F times L over A times E. Right? Therefore, if uh, the change in the voltage of that circuit or around this resistor is proportional to the change in the length, the change in the length itself is also proportional to what? Proportional to the force. So by uh, some, it's not that simple, it's not always this linear, but you can say from here that, for example, I can say, let's say that change in the voltage is proportional to the force that they applied, and by some calibration, you can uh, measure what? Measure the amount of force that is applied. So I don't wanna get into string gauges right now, but just wanted to let you know that mostly, there are strain gauges in these force or torque sensors. So you either have a wrist force sensor that only gives you the forces. You might have a joint torque sensor that only gives you the torques. Most of the time, you might have a combination, which is called force torque sensor, FT sensor. And there are six axes. They are like the best, but most expensive, of course. Another word that you might hear for these sensors is the word transducer, okay, which is basically any electrical device that can measure fast variation in some physical quantity. You might call it a transducer. And the other type of sensor you have are tactile sensors. So tactile sensors uh, are the sensors that are typically at the end or the fingertips at the end of the fingers and they also really also have strain gauges or they might have piezo -electro, uh, piezoelectronic components. And again, based on the deformation of these uh, flexible elements, 
you can have by a good calibration a very good estimate of the force that they are applying to the environment or back from the environment to them okay so there are different types of force sensors and they have different level of accuracy and expenses now uh as i told you the best uh, sensor is the six axis ft sensor good so uh before i get into the control pure control of a robot let me also tell you a couple of terminologies that you might hear in the field of force control for robots uh, let me familiarize you with those and then we go into the pure force control one of them is called a compliance frame or a constraint frame which is the frame in which the task is to be done in the most convenient manner so let's say for example uh, this is like a whiteboard or something and uh, your uh, robot and the factor the gripper has a pin And the goal of it is to write something here. Okay, let's say you want to write something on this whiteboard. So uh, what you can do is this. If you are writing, let's say, on a flat piece of um, paper or flat surface, you can assign a plane to that surface and maybe call it XC and YC. And this is the plane in which you need to control the motion, right? Because you want the tip of the pen or the end effector to follow a specific trajectory. So in the XY plane, you definitely need motion control. On the other hand, normal to the plane or in the direction of Z, you need what? You need force control. Because if you basically don't control the force, you either will have no or very bare minimal contact of tip of the pen with the paper, which barely will leave any trace behind. Or if you uh, basically push it a little bit further down and uh, apply too much of force, you might really easily um, break down the tip of the pen or break the entire pen. Okay, so as I told you, uh, most of the tasks in real life is a combination of motion control in some directions and force control in the other directions, right? Okay, so just keep that in mind when we go to pure force control. I'll talk about it again, but um, just wanted to tell you that this frame X, Y, Z, C, align two of that, you need the motion control, align the other one, you need the force control. This is the frame that we call a uh, constraint frame or a compliance frame at that location because I can have my frame anywhere, right? And in any orientation. So which one is the best one in describing what kind of control and what kind of action i need and i assume this compliance or constraint frame is the best one or the most convenient one the other terminologies i wanted to tell you is natural versus artificial constraints so what are these if your goal is to perform some task let's say here you have this peg and here there is a hole in this block right so there is this hole and there is this peg and your goal is to what your goal is to either put the peg inside the hole or lift it up right that's all you need to do let's say your goal is to lift the peg out of the hole it's a pick and place job or uh let's say yeah it is it could be so you are picking up the peg from inside the hole and you want to place it elsewhere so uh how would you describe this uh motion and the type of constraint that are um applied to the peg well in this case if i use that compliance frame again x y and z of c you know that because this hole is all around the peg right here i'm just showing a section of it but in reality, this block goes all the way around right, the object. So because this hole is all around the object, I cannot move the peg in the XC or YC direction, 
because it is going to press the peg against the walls of the holes and brackets. So those two conditions, no motion along xc or yc or x dot c or y dot c, which here we show with vx and vy, equal to zero, they are coming from what? They are coming from the boundary conditions. The boundary of the hole does not allow it. Those conditions defined by boundary conditions, we call them natural constraints. I cannot move along x or y. At the same time, I cannot also rotate about x and y. If I rotate about x, if I rotate about y, this peg, again, is going to press against the walls. And it's not possible. Therefore, no rotation about x, no rotation about y. So omega x and omega y both ought to be what? Zero. So these four conditions so far are your natural constraints. They come from boundary conditions. On the other hand, you might say, well, you said about omega x, omega y, v x, and v y. What about omega z and v z? So v z, which is the speed at which you move this peg out of the hole, do I have anything from the uh, boundary condition that will determine the amount of this v z? Do I have any constraint from the boundary conditions here that would limit the amount of VZ for me, like make it zero or uh, any number, right? Is there any constraint? The answer is no. It's up to you how fast you want to remove the peg out of the hole. The boundary condition has no say in it. So this VZ, whatever number I choose for VZ, is not dictated by boundary condition. So if I choose a constant value of V desired for VZ, that condition is not a natural condition. That is what we call artificial constraint. Artificial means we decided how much it should be based on the specifications of the control problem, right? So, not the boundary condition. So, artificial conditions or constraints are the ones that we used based on the reference inputs, based on the jobs that the uh, control algorithm has to make. Nothing from the boundary condition is dictating them, right? So, V of Z equal VD is one of those. The other thing is, do I need to spin this guy when I bring it out? And the answer is no. What does it give you? Does it have any specific application? And you might say, well, no. So here I decide that I do not really need to spin it. So I said omega z equal to zero, right? But even if I didn't and set it equal to some constant number, would that be determined or dictated or affected by the boundary condition? No. Why not? Because in this case, we are talking about that here I have what? I have no friction. If I had some friction, then that would be a different scenario. And if between the peg and between the walls, there was what? No clearance. So there was no gap whatsoever. And I had dry friction or viscous friction or anything, then the condition would be different. But here we assume that there is no condition, no friction, either because the walls are perfectly smooth or because there is enough of gap. It's a clearance fit or a loose fit. There is enough a gap between the wall and the peg. So it is not um, affecting the walls how much I spin. So I say I don't want to spin. So I say omega z equals zero. So these two, I call them what? Artificial constraints. Okay, good. So we talked so far about v and omegas. Out of the six Vs and omegas, we determine which ones are natural, which ones are artificial. How about the forces and the moments, right? So far, they were kinematic uh, quantities. What about kinetic quantities, Fs and Taus? Well, on the other hand, if I say, well, how much of force do you want your uh, robot to apply in the X direction, right? on the peg and then peg applies it to the wall and the wall applies back in the x direction how much do you want this end effector that is here to apply a force along the x direction do 
do I need to do so? Here, because I want to just remove the peg out of the hole with, and there is no friction and I don't want really any contact with the walls, I say, hey, I do not want to apply any force in the X direction. Why should I do so? Why should I rub the peg against the walls? So again, I make a decision on that. I make a decision. It's not really determined by the natural condition. I say, I don't need any force along X nor anything along Y. So Fx equals 0 and Fy equals 0. Again, I decide on them. And I say, I don't want them. So both of them are artificial. Right? Good. Now, what about, uh, let's say, Fz? Fz. How much Fz is uh, involved here? How much Fz should I apply in this case? Well, you need Fz for what? You need Fz if you want to uh, cancel basically the um, uh, friction here, right? Or gravity or both. So here, remember, I said no what? Friction. Good. Where does this no friction come from? Does it come from my boundary condition? Or did I decide that there is no friction here? Well, of course, it comes from my boundary condition. Because here, there is what? There is some gap. Gap means there is no contact, means no friction. And no friction means what? Means the total force that I need to apply in the Z direction, if I neglect the gravity, if I neglect the gravity and say this is a very lightweight object, all it is is really what? Equal to zero. In the case that I do have gravity, I have to say Fz equals what? Mg. But both of those, whether it's 0 or mg, the results is what? Due to the fact that I said there is no friction. It is affected by the fact that I said no friction. So clearly, when I say f of z equals 0 or f of z equals mg, either case, that is affected by natural constraint. Or it is a natural constraint because it comes from the fact that there is a gap in the boundaries. The same thing about tau z. If there was any friction here, if there was any friction and I wanted to spin this guy, then definitely I needed some torque to make the spin happen. But first of all, I decided that I do not want to spin. Second of all, again, there is a gap and no friction. So definitely, because there is no friction, I do not even need any torque in the z direction to make the spin happen. Although I don't really need the spin, but even if I wanted to, I really did not need much of a friction if I just neglected what? Again, the weight of the part. Okay, so even if there was, if there was, uh, the uh, mass of the part was considerable, Right, then it was I about Z times omega Z dot. Correct? But there was no extra term here because there is no friction. So the fact that this tau Z is affected by no friction or by, no, by the boundary condition, by no gap, that means what? It is a natural constraint. And then you can make a very similar argument about tau x and tau y that I chose them to be what? Zero because um, I do not really need any rotation about x or any rotation about y. I do not need that. This guy needs to just come up straight. I don't need to tilt it. So those two can be considered as a part of what? My artificial constraints, okay? One thing that you can see side by side is this. 
if you choose a kinematic quantity or not choose if a kinematic quantity is a natural constraint the cause of that the kinetic quantity corresponding to that is going to be artificial right so vx and vy the kinematic constraints for x and y the kinematic uh, quantities for x and y are what natural they are dictated by boundaries the cause of those motions which is fx and fy whatever they are they are determined by what by the control algorithm and similarly like what omega x and omega y right the corresponding cause tau x and tau y they are artificial on the other hand if a kinetic quantity is natural then the result of that the kinematic result of that is also what is artificial so you cannot have both let's say fz and vz under natural or both omega x and tau x under artificial one is in one direction one is under one category the other is under the other category in other words if i want to put it all in simple english in each direction we either control the motion or the force Because these are the things that we choose. These are the things that are uh, imposed on us. So if you look under the artificial that we choose, you never see Fx and Vx both are under artific uh, artificial. You'd never see both Fy and Vy under artificial. In one direction, you choose to change the motion. In the other direction, you choose to what? to choose the uh, or control the force or the torque you cannot do both in the x direction both force and v or omega and tau it's not possible and this is what we call duality of force motion okay so now with all of this let's look at how we control the force as i said the control that we do here is called pure force control what does that even mean it means that um, the environment as you can see here the environment is applying resistance in each and every one of the directions okay so if you have this robot and this is your end effector in all three directions x y and z you get a force from the environment fx f y and what f z let's see and your goal is to control all three of them how much of force either i am applying to the environment or the environment is applying to me but you know this is not possible why because we just learned that in any direction you either control the force or the motion and if in both of x in all directions x y and z i control the force what does it mean in none of these directions i control the motion and what does that mean if i cannot control the end effector motion in any of the x y z direction it means the end effector ought to be constant in the space in the location of that the position of that it has to be stationary in the space and when can that be when can your end effector be stationary in the space yet uh, trying to apply force to the space where you're holding it in position right where 
you are like what? Like a crazy superhuman being that have an infinite amount of force. And what? You are trying to keep this, you have, let's say, this big Hulk hand, right? And you are trying to keep that end effector in position. And do not let that end effector move even for one millimeter in any direction. Now I want to control how much of force the end effector should apply to you. You know you cannot do that. There is no human I'll, I, unless the robot is just made of very uh, flimsy plastic material or something that can hold the end effector and not let it move. Right? For industrial robots or even mid-sized robots for educations, it's kind of close to impossible for us humans to keep the end effector from moving. And even if we do so, what's the point of it? The end effector is supposed to move and do something. If we just hold it in place, what have we achieved, right? So that's why you say here it says the pure force control is like, for example, when the end effector is embedded in concrete or you are holding it in position. We never really what? We never really have such a situation in real life only in specific directions we control the force in other directions we allow the motion to happen when we allow the motion to happen it means we have no control over what fx and f y here And where in the direction that we control the force here, FZ, it means what? In this direction, no control over the motion. Okay, that's why I said at the end of the day, we have to resort to what? To the hybrid force motion control. But before we get there and we study it, we really need to assume that, hey, what if we want to control force in all three directions? Okay, so if you remember the equation of motion for a robot, if there is a wrench at the um, end effector and we call it F tip, and remember the wrench was the combination of uh the forces and the torques okay so if we combine them into a, a six by one vector we call it the wrench in some textbook instead of uh, f here or this version of f they use the letter um, new so um if the end effector wrench the forces and the torques add the end effector or F tip, if you remember the equation of motion for the robot is whatever we had in the previous videos, MQ double dot plus C times Q dot plus G of Q equal tau, plus this extra term J transpose times F of tip, and that comes from the formula that the uh, if you want to relate the um, forces or the wrench at the end effector to the torques at the joints all you need to do is to multiply transpose of jacobian by the wrench at the end effector and that gives you an equivalent what an equivalent uh, torque vector at the joints correct and we had this in one of our uh, previous videos if you go there uh, here you can see we uh, discussed this topic so if this is the equation of motion of the robot then here let's say i have some desired wrench correct and then i have some actual wrench this wrench i can measure using what using that uh, wrist six axis uh, FT sensor. Mm 
measured by, correct? This is what you want the end effector to apply to the environment. The difference between the desired range and the actual range is going to be the error in the range, Fe. And ideally, I want this Fe to be what? Zero. Good. Now, how do I do it? Well, all I need is this. How much torque should I apply to my motors so that at the end effector, my F of tip should converge to what? F of D. What should I do? I say, well, remember always that these terms are the nonlinear terms. If my torque can have something plus all of these terms, which is MQ double dot plus uh, CQ dot plus G. If I can have all of these terms in addition to something else, the best thing that happens is these terms are going to go away. So now it looks like I'm down to a linear system which I can easily control. Okay. Now, the question is, can I always add these terms here? Well, if I want to create these terms in my controller, G, C, Q dot, and M, Q double dot, it's not trivial, really. Why? Because if I want to form G and M, as you clearly can see in G and M, I need what? I need Q as well as C. So I have to have a way to measure Q, and we learned that you can do it by encoders. I also need to have a measure of Q dot, which you can get by tachometers. But if you remember, the measurement of Q double dot is not that trivial, right? You typically do not have a sensor that can give you what? The Q double dots, okay? This is not something that is easily possible by a sensor, and that's why you have to do what? You have to calculate Q double dot by numerical derivations or differentiations. And numerical differentiation is always prone to errors, okay? So at best, even if everything else is ideal, which is not, this Q double dot is like Q double dot hat. It's not perfect. It has estimates. In reality, all of these other things are also hats. Because my sensors have errors and I always have some parts of the dynamic model that I cannot really model perfectly. So my hope is these guys are very close to the actual ones that at least they can reduce the magnitude of the left hand side and make it close to zero. Kind of cancel, not exactly cancel. So if I hope for the best and say they will cancel each other or almost cancel, now I'm down to this linear system that you see inside the red box. Now what should I do? I say, well, how about I also get rid of this J because this J also has nonlinear terms in it. So I say this tau is equal to J transpose times what? F desired. Okay? If I say that, what is that going to give me? That gives me that f of tip equals f of d. But you know, that's not going to happen in real life. And you will have what? You will have some errors on the two sides. So instead of converting it into an algebraic equation like this, you try to add something here multiplied by j transpose that it will convert this guy here into a differential equation, the result of which converges to zero over time. So you cannot simply say FD, because if you say so, basically what you're doing is going to be what? It's going to be, if you do it, it is going to be like FD minus F um, of tip. This is like a PD, a, a proportional control with a gain of 1. Okay, that is going to be your control system. 
But instead of that, what you do is you add a proportional term, kp times the error term, plus an integral term, ki times integral of fe, and the feedforward term, fd, times j transpose, and then you also add all of those other nonlinear terms to it. If you do all of these terms for the tau and plug it right here, as I said, the nonlinear terms would go away. The J transpose from both sides, you can cancel out by multiplying by a J, as long as you are not in singularity or close to it. And then what you will get is this equation. First order differential equation, where the solution for f e of t is going to be whatever it was in the beginning times exponential of negative omega times t, where omega is the root of the characteristic equation here, which is k uh, p plus 1 times s plus k i equals 0. Okay, so if you find the root of this, then clearly this omega here, magnitude-wise, is just ki over kp plus 1. So using a pi, proportional integral controller, and the feedforward term, this is your feedforward term, you can do what? You can achieve uh, asymptotic convergence to zero. Okay? Um, now, can I add a derivative term? Yes. So instead of this here that you see in the equation dollar, can I also added one extra term, and that was some kd and times fe dot. Could I add one extra term here, and instead of a pi, I have used a pid controller? Absolutely, I could have used a pid controller. If that is the case, what's going to happen to your equation? This equation will be turned into what? It's going to be kd fe double dot plus 1, or i in general, plus kp times Fe, remember Fe is a vector, and then plus Ki times Fe, this is Fe dot, is equal to vector 0. Okay, and Kd and Kp and Ki, they are typically diagonal matrices with the specific gains. So can I do that? Sure. Why don't we typically use a Kd? most of the time why we don't use a derivative term because we are taking derivative of forces which forces fe fe is what fd minus f tip fd desired is typically a smooth function that's what we want the smooth force applied to the environment but f tip which is coming from your uh, sensor ft sensor these forces typically have a lot of noise in them. They are very noisy signal. And taking derivative out of a noisy signal is by no means a good idea to pass as a portion of your torque to the joints. Derivatives of noise signals are really large, and you don't want to pass them as control signals. They make the system unstable. So even if we want to apply a derivative term, and why should we apply a derivative term in the first place? Because of its damping effects, because it makes the convergence to zero a lot faster than a pi. Why do we need an i term? We learned in the past we need the i term to remove the steady state error. Okay, And it is very important because here we are just hoping for the best that the left and the right nonlinear terms will cancel, which not always happens. If they don't cancel each other, you will never get convergence to zero. You always have steady state error. So the I term is necessary to make sure that you can achieve a relatively good uh, convergence of error to zero. D can accelerate the convergence of error to zero. 
but again because of the noise signal instead of a derivative we use a low pass filter plus a derivative which we call it the high pass filter okay the transfer function of a high pass filter if I look at it in the S domain instead of being like KD times S it is what it's KD times S over let's say S plus one or something or S plus whatever you want S plus uh, P or something like that this is a high pass filter which is the same as KD times S times 1 over s plus p this guy here is a low pass filter it removes noise this is a derivative term and the combination of that is called a high pass filter this is like a derivative over a smooth signal for which the high frequency noise is gone so this is what you typically use in a pid controller it's not PID, it's called PIDF, and I mentioned that in one of my control lectures. Instead of PID, they use PID plus filter. Which filter? Low pass filter. Okay, so the um, really the uh, transfer function of that is like KP plus KD over S divided by S plus like N, and then plus uh, KI over S. Okay, so that's probably what you need to use a PIDF for the force control. Again, because the force signals from your sensors are very noisy. Uh, a few other things that we need to talk about before the hybrid uh, force motion control, which is actually our next video, is many times uh, the dynamic terms M q double dot and cq q dot these terms are not always very large terms why aren't they because the robot in many cases is not moving that fast if the robot does not move very fast i might be able to neglect these terms see they are small compared to the rest of the stuff and just approximate my control signal by this which only basically compensates for the weight of the members as well as what controls the amount of force. Okay, so many times you might see this kind of control and the M Q double dot and C Q dot are not involved. One, because they are small. Two, actually they prefer to not include them because as I told you, the Q double dot term is not super easy to accurately include that term is really what you have to just do it numerically and uh, you will never get a good estimate of mq double dot in real life you always get some big time estimations and that causes steady state errors and if you already have the uh, integral term to cancel that uh, steady state error you would rather even not include these terms which are not accurate especially the first term which is not accurate anyways okay but if the robot does not move fast then you have a very good excuse to do so so just keep that in mind uh, one other thing that i want to mention is well uh, what if the robots now, with this uh, control method that we just talked about, what if the robot is now not set into the concrete? Or what if the robot tip and the factor is not held by a super strong person in place? What is this control algorithm is going to do? So you are controlling the force of the end effector in the example that I just mentioned for you here. You are holding it in place again, correct? And all of a sudden, you let go. What's going to happen to the end effector? Well, guess what? In all of those directions that you were trying to cancel its force or kind of keep it in place, now there is nothing to hold it. So what's going to happen? This guy is going to rush in all directions. All of the force that was applied to cancel your force now is just free to accelerate the end effector. So you see the end effector flies 
toward all x and y and z direction. And if something is on its way, it is going to smash them so badly. So in order to reduce that huge acceleration that this method can cause and cause disasters, uh, uh, basically could be very dangerous, is I might add some negative term, some negative damping term here for you to slow down the uh, acceleration of the um, end effector. So I add a damping term and I call it negative K of damping times the uh, twist Xi. Because as I told you, if it starts to accelerate, what happens to Xi? Remember Xi is what? V and omega. So when it accelerates, your V and omega will skyrocket, will go very, very big numbers. And if they do, then this damping term, which is negative K damping times Xi, is going to go up bigly too. So what happens? When this negative term goes big time up, your torque has to go down. And when torque goes down, then the growth of V and omega gets a little bit more under control. So that's a damping term that you might add. But it's not really going to solve the problem. It's not. It's like holding some wild animal in place by a lot of force and then what? Let go. And that thing will just move out of its position and destroys anything on its path. So the pure force control, as I told you, is by no means something realistic. What you really need is what we call hybrid force motion control, where in some directions that you need to control the motion, you only control the motion. You don't care about what happens to the force. And in some other directions that you care about controlling the force, you do not care about the motion. You kind of separate control of the force and the control of the motion. And that's the topic of our next video, hybrid force motion control. You separate these two tasks, not do both of them along the same direction because it's not even physically possible. Okay, so although we have seen this force control in this video, keep in mind it is not really used in practice because it's not really practical. It's going to be very, very dangerous. And you clearly saw that, again, by choosing tau according to this formula, my goal was to cancel these nonlinear terms, right? All of them. And that's why we call this method also what? Feedback linearization. So I include some terms in my control signal that are coming from feedback, like Q and Q dot. And uh, F uh, tip, they are all coming from feedback from sensors. And I try to uh, linearize the system by eliminating the nonlinear terms. So this is the feedback linearization control, and or you might call it the inverse dynamics control. Okay? So um, hopefully this uh, video was useful to you, and you learned some basic idea about what pure or ideal force control would look like. Now, I'm not going to uh, simulate this scenario here for you in MATLAB or Simulink because it's not, again, uh, practical. But once we get into our next video, which is hybrid force motion control, and we learn how to do both of them at the same time, I will provide you with a MATLAB Simulink demo. So thank you so much for your attention, and I will see you in my next video. Thank you so much.